welcome back to Queens of the Damned Horror Podcast. This week we are going to do some more unsolved mysteries. We are missing Nikki this week, so it's going to be just Rachel and I. But the two of us talk enough to fill up the space, don't worry. Rachel chose one that is fairly well known, and I chose one that you've probably heard before if you're a fan of unsolved mysteries. Or if you haven't, it should be a fun story. Happy listening! So I chose the Chicago Tylenol Murders. So when we did our Zodiac serial killer episode, I picked someone from Chicago. And so I had this idea that true crime episodes, I'm going to try and work my way through the Chicago land, unsolved mysteries, solved mysteries, serial killers, whatever. So there's a bunch of them. And this case I think is really interesting because it changed the whole country and in ways that like, you don't even know, because I know you've never heard of this before. The Chicago Tylenol murders began on September 29th, 1982. Uh, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman of Elk Grove Village, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, uh, woke up at dawn and went into her parents' bedroom. She didn't feel good, and she complained of having a sore throat and a runny nose. So her parents gave her an extra-strength Tylenol. At 7 a.m., they found Mary on the bathroom floor. She was immediately taken to the hospital, where she was later pronounced dead. And the doctors initially suspected that she had had, like, a freak stroke and died, Mm -hmm. right? So that same day in the afternoon, paramedics were called to the Arlington Heights home of 27-year-old postal worker Adam Janice. Again, Arlington Heights is another Chicago suburb. Um, When they arrived, they found him lying on the floor. His breathing was labored, his blood pressure was extremely low, and his pupils were fixed and dilated. The paramedics rushed Adam to the emergency room at Northwest Community Hospital, where they attempted to resuscitate him, but it was too late. Uh, Adam died shortly after he was brought to the hospital. His death was believed to be the result of a massive heart attack. So as Adam is laying, dying in the hospital, obviously his entire family is extremely grief stricken. So they all gather at Adam's house um, to sort of discuss what's going on and basically begin to plan the funeral because they know he's not going to make it right Mm -hmm. at this point. Um, So some of the family members that were there included Adam's 25 year old brother, Stanley, and his 19 year old wife, Teresa. And obviously, when you lose a close family member, you're incredibly stressed out, right? You're Mm -hmm. upset. You've been crying. So a lot of the time, you get a headache. So to Stanley's relief, he found on Adam's kitchen counter a bottle of extra strength Tylenol. He took a capsule from the bottle and then gave one to his wife. Shortly after taking the capsules, both Stanley and his wife collapsed onto the floor The other shocked family members immediately called an ambulance. Once again, paramedics rushed to the home and attempted to resuscitate the young couple. However, Stanley died later that night and his wife died two days later without regaining consciousness. So according to an article in the Chicago Sun-Times by Tamara Kaplan, Dr. Thomas Kim at the Northwest Community Hospital became suspicious following the deaths of the three family members. It was suspected that poisonous gas could have caused the untimely death of Adam, Stanley, and Teresa. However, after consulting with someone at the Rocky Mountain Poison Control Center, it was determined that based on their symptoms, cyanide might be the culprit. Hmm. Blood samples were taken from the victims and sent to a lab for testing. So while the blood samples were being tested, obviously this is the early 80s. The testing procedures were probably way, 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 way slower than they would be now, where I'm sure they could get the results, like, within an hour or two. Mm -hmm. Um, So while they're waiting for these blood samples to come back, two firefighters in one of the Chicago suburbs discussed the four bizarre deaths that had recently taken place. Arlington Heights firefighter Philip Capitelli talked with his friend Richard Keyworth from the Elk Grove Firehouse about Mary Kellerman and the fact that she had taken Tylenol before she died. 
Keyworth suggested that all the deaths could have been related to the medicine. Following his friend's suggestion, Capitelli called the paramedics who worked on the Janus family and asked if they too had taken Tylenol. To both men's surprise, they discovered all three Janus family members had taken Tylenol from the same bottle. The police were immediately sent to the Kellerman and Janus homes to retrieve the suspicious bottles. So the following day, all of their hunches were confirmed. Uh, Cook County's chief toxicologist, Michael Schaefer, examined the capsules and discovered that they were filled with approximately 65 milligrams of deadly cyanide, which is 10,000 times more than the amount needed to kill the average person. Oh my god. Yes. And obviously the blood samples also came back positive that um, they had been poisoned with cyanide. Wow. So Mick, so at this point, everyone starts freaking out, right? <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, McNeil Consumer Products, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, who is the maker of extra strength Tylenol, was immediately alerted. They began a massive recall and started to warn doctors, hospitals, and retailers of the potential dangers and that they needed to dispose or send back all Tylenol that they had. Not just the extra strength, but like any Tylenol, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But unfortunately, the news was not fast enough to get out to the general population. Um, Now, some of these I could not find exact dates for for bizarre reasons, like the dates that they died. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Cause not everything was, not everything is online yet. Mm-hmm. Obviously I did check newspapers.com, but it wasn't there yet. Um, so 27 year old Mary Reiner of Winfield, Illinois was recovering after the birth of her son. And obviously when you have a baby, you're in a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. So she, but she was home. She unsuspectingly ingested some Tylenol laced with cyanide and died a short time later. Uh, The same day, 35-year-old Paula Prince, a United Airlines stewardess, was found dead in her suburban Chicago apartment. Cyanide-filled Tylenol capsules were also found in her home. And the seventh known victim is 35-year-old Mary McFarland of Elmhurst, Illinois, who was also discovered dead in her home. So soon afterwards, um, national news stories obviously started to break. And widespread fear swept throughout the country, but it was especially bad in Chicago and its suburbs. Um, The police drove through the city using loudspeakers to warn citizens about the potential dangers of Tylenol. Oh, my God. Obviously, this is before the Internet. (laughs) How else were they going to get the word out, right? Not everybody gets the newspaper. Even then, not everybody got the newspaper. Oh, my God. And not everybody had a TV, um, which... Basically, it did warn people, but it also made people even more scared. Mm -hmm. Uh, So citizens across the country literally ran home from work, the store, whatever they were doing, to throw out their bottles of Tylenol before someone in their home could take it. So according to a Time article by Susan Tift, hospitals in the Chicago area were flooded with telephone calls concerning Tylenol and fears of poisoning. Jason Manning's article, also in Time, called The Tylenol Murders, stated that the growing nationwide panic prompted the head of Seattle's Poison Control Center to inform citizens that if they had indeed been poisoned with cyanide, they would be dead before they would even be able to make a telephone call (laughs) to the hospital or the police. Uh, But nevertheless, hospitals around the country admitted many patients under the suspicion of cyanide, cyanide poisoning from Tylenol. The rapid influx of patients was mostly due to mixed signals from the health authorities concerning the threat and symptoms and the ensuing panic of people who really believed that they might have fallen victim to poisoning from the tainted capsules. As we all know, mass hysteria is a Mm -hmm. thing. Um, So, like, mm -hmm. what would they pump your stomach? Like, if you ingested Tylenol and then they were like, like, say, say you know that you took one of those pills that had cyanide in it. And you, you know, you, like found out before you died. I mean, but the thing is, is that you you can't. I mean, you yeah. you take that much cyanide. It's like the the brother and the sister in law of the postal mm-hmm. worker. You take that much cyanide, and you literally just like fall down foaming at the mouth. Yeah. I mean, that's it. 
Like like the guy said, you wouldn't even be able to make a phone call. Yeah. You wouldn't even be able to scream for help. You'd just fall down dead. Or ex- so ill that you would go into a coma. Yeah. Jeez. But, uh, yeah, like I said, obviously, you know, mass hysteria is a thing. I'm sure people did present with some symptoms of cyanide poisoning because they were so scared mm-hmm. and convinced themselves that they had it. Yeah. You know? So there were no new cases of poisoning related to Tylenol after these seven victims, um, at least in the Chicago area. But many states and retailers still took drastic measures, excuse me, drastic measures to assure that it remained that way. Um, Some health departments banned all forms of Tylenol products. Moreover, many retailers completely removed Tylenol products from their shelves Uh, Many other states and retailers decided to follow the FDA's warning and remove only the products with particular serial numbers linked with deaths that pose the greatest threats. Um, Obviously, at this point, uh, Tylenol's reputation was completely ruined. No one wanted to buy Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tylenol. Um, So the company was kind of um, in a panic at this point. And Johnson and Johnson, which obviously is a huge company, Mm -hmm. we all know Johnson and Johnson, but they were at danger of going under because of this, because why would anyone trust any other Johnson and Johnson product? Mm -hmm. Right. One of their products just killed seven people. Yeah. In a matter of like five days. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, so they basically opened up their own investigation. So the first thing they did was issued a nationwide alert to the public, doctors and distributors of the drug. Um, They recalled 31 million Tylenol bottles, which cost the company about $125 million. Um, They also established a crisis hotline so that consumers could obtain the latest information about the poisoning, safety measures, and other information concerning the drug. Um, Then they also sent out health inspectors to examine the factories where the tainted bottles were produced to see if the cyanide was somehow put into the capsules during um, production. So um, following the inspections, the company determined that the cyanide was not introduced into the bottles at the factory, which left only one other possibility. The FBI, FDA, and law enforcement realized that someone had methodically taken the Tylenol bottles off the shelves um, at the store, filled the capsules with cyanide, and put them back. What the fuck? (laughs) Yes. Um, They had no evidence as to who might have committed the heinous crime, and there was continuing public fear that more deaths might occur unless they caught the person who did it. Um, October 2nd, 1982, so this is about five days after the first death, so all seven victims are dead at this point, Um, another contaminated Tylenol bottle was discovered by police from a batch of bottles removed from a drugstore in the Chicago suburbs. So thousands of bottles underwent testing for traces of cyanide because they obviously had no idea which bottles were tampered with and which weren't. Um, so, but at this point, investigators discovered that the cyanide lace capsules were placed in six Chicago area stores. There was a jewel in Arlington Heights, a jewel in Elk Grove Village, um, an Osco drugstore in Schaumburg, uh, Walgreens in Chicago, I don't know which one, uh, Frank's Finer Foods in Winfield, and another undisclosed retail outlet. So each store contained one tampered bottle with approximately three to 10 tainted capsules, except for the Osco, which had two, two bad bottles. Um, So the police believed that the bottles were randomly placed. However, they obviously could never discount that the person who did this may have chosen these specific locations for whatever reason. Some speculation says that the person who did it may have held a grudge against Johnson and Johnson. Um, They may have held a grudge against uh, some of the stores. 
Some people have even suggested that they were targeting one specific person who was killed in the murders, and that's why they stopped. Because they got whoever it was they were going after. Mm Mm-hmm. So shortly following the murders, Johnson and Johnson received a handwritten extortion letter demanding $1 million to end the poisonings. The extortionist asked Johnson and Johnson to respond to his demand via the Chicago Tribune. Um, Instead, the company called the police and the FBI who began to trace the letter's source. Uh, It didn't take them long to trace the letter to a man named James W. Lewis, who was a known con artist who was also sought in connection with the brutal murder of an elderly man in Kansas City and a jewel robbery. They issued a warrant and began a massive manhunt for Lewis and his wife, Leanne. They went across like six or seven states to try and find these people. While they are looking for this person... (laughs) Uh, During the last week of October, lab technicians in in Chicago discovered yet another unsold tainted bottle of Tylenol in a grocery store in North Chicago. The bottle was found less than one block from where Paula Prince purchased the bottle containing the cyanide lace capsules that ended her life one month earlier. Okay, I have a question real quick. Yes. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. But did they not have, like, those protective covers on the bottles around this time do you know what i mean yes i do and that we were going to get to that oh, okay <laughs> yes that is coming okay that is coming don't worry because all i'm sitting here thinking that. is like how did they get that pulled back and put the cyanide in we are gonna get okay. to that okay. yeah we're gonna okay. get to that um but they did they they examined the bottle for obviously this was like i don't think dna testing was around at this time or if it was it was extremely early in dna testing Um, but they did examine it for fingerprints and found none. They found no clues on the bottle that might link it to somebody. So on December 13th, 1982, FBI agents arrested Lewis and his wife at the New York Public Library. So during questioning by police, um, the couple denied having anything to do with the poisoning of the Tylenol capsules. Um, Lewis actually denied writing the letter, even though... His handwriting and a fingerprint found on the letter was an exact match. Uh, So for a minute, they think they have their guy, but unfortunately, they did not. Um, Registration records produced by the New York police show that during the time the bottles were tampered with, the Lewises were living in a hotel in New York. And further evidence proved that Leanne Lewis was at her job every day in New York. She didn't miss a day when the bottles were tampered with and her co-workers confirmed that her husband would meet her every day for lunch and pick her up after work so they were unable to find any bus train airline or rental car records indicating that the lewis's traveled to chicago during the time when the bottles were tampered with so basically at this point they let them go and they had no leads None whatsoever. Lewis was found guilty of extortion and and six unrelated counts of mail and credit card fraud and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. So to the question that you asked. <laughs> so as a direct consequence of this, Congress approved in May 1983 the Tylenol Bill, which made the malicious tampering of consumer products a federal offense. And then in 1989, the FDA set national requirements for all over-the-counter products to be tamper-resistant. So that's what I mean (laughs) when I say this changed. I mean, I assume it's the same in a lot of Western countries. I don't know. I've never bought Tylenol in Canada. I've never bought Tylenol in the UK. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you if they come with a seal. I assume they do. But... That's why everything comes in tamper-resistant packaging. That's why everything you buy says, if this seal is broken, do not eat this, do not take these pills, do not use this, return it Mm -hmm. to the place that you bought it. Because there's no guarantee that it's not poisoned. Yeah. 
So those are the Tylenol murders. Wow. Um, I have no idea who the person was that did this or why. I have no theories. Mm-hmm. I have to admit, I have none whatsoever. I nothing just seems like a good enough reason. Mm-hmm. Like, did they do it because they were crazy and it seemed like a good idea? Did they do it because they were a disgruntled Johnson and Johnson former employee? But that just seems so bizarre. How do you even? Okay, I don't know enough about chemicals, but how? Like, uh-huh. do, can you buy cyanide pills? Or like, how do you get them? I assume you could buy powdered cyanide. And so I think what you would do is, my guess is the Tylenol were like the capsules where it's almost like two parts put together. Okay. Because they were the extra strength. So I would guess you could like screw it apart. Oh, I see. And dump the Tylenol out and then put the cyanide in and screw it back together. But again, like, why? Yeah. And why in some of these bottles were there only three tainted Tylenol? Yeah. Yeah. Like, how long were they going to sit there and... Because, like, I personally can buy a bottle of aspirin and have it last me for, like, eight months. Yeah. So, why... I I don't get it. I just... I don't know. I have no... I have no theories about this one, which is what part of what appeals to it to me, is that to me Mm -hmm. it's a complete unknown. Yeah. I, I... I guess anything sounds reasonable and anything sounds so ridiculous that it's unreasonable. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's yeah. no manifesto. There's no direct correlation. It's not like, you know, this was attack on government employees. So, you know, it's some anti-government nut, even if they don't catch them. This was just somebody poisoning Tylenol around the city of Chicago in the suburbs. Yeah. Methodically driving to all of these different drugstores, buying a bottle of Tylenol, unscrewing the capsules, putting cyanide in them, and then bringing it back and putting it on the shelf. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't know. I have no theories. I mean, to be honest, like, I don't, I don't really trust big corporations. Mm-hmm. So, like, when, when you say, like, they went and tested their lab and everything and it, there's no mm-hmm. way it could have happened there, like, I just don't trust when companies say that because Johnson & Johnson is huge. Well, but like, here's most the products thing. are sold, or a lot of products are sold under Johnson & Johnson and- mm-hmm. Big corporations like that kind of run the country, and so like it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if something happened in the process that they just covered up. There could have been more bottles, and they just didn't tell anyone. Well, but the FBI were the ones testing the bottles. Johnson and Johnson wasn't testing the bottles that they took off the store shelves. Yeah, but didn't Johnson and Johnson test their lab? I, uh, I don't know. It just says that they ordered the labs to be tested. So I don't know if the FDA came in and did it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they hired people to do it. I would think the FDA would come in and do it. Mm-hmm. But to me, what's weird is that if it was something done in the lab, how did every single bottle end up in the Chicagoland area? If it yeah. was something done in the factory, wouldn't a couple of bottles have popped up somewhere else? Because like they said, they were telling people around the country, you know, if you have a bottle in this sequence of serial numbers, turn it into the police. Mm-hmm. Right? So it just seems to me that a couple of poison bottles would have popped up somewhere else. But they were all... And all of these suburbs are not super far from the city. I mean, at the most, so Schaumburg, I think, is the furthest. And Schaumburg's about an hour outside the city. Mm-hmm. And that's from where I used to live. So from downtown, it might be even less. In downtown, I bet it's like 45 minutes. So it's not like this person was driving all over the country dropping these bottles off. Mm-hmm. I mean, they very specifically targeted the Chicago area. Probably because they lived there. Yeah. I don't know. 
I don't know either. And then, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just, for me, because I've thought that too, is that maybe there was a slip up or it was someone working in the factory that did it. But again, how did they all end up in one place? Mm-hmm. You know, because it just seems like some of them would have popped up someplace else. You know? Yeah. In Indiana or up in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. You know, but they were all in Chicago in the immediate suburbs. Yeah, I guess I don't I don't fully know how, like, manufacturing and shipping works. Because all I can think is, like, the shipment that was received in that area mm-hmm. were just, like, all the same batch. Right, but it would have, but it was going to multiple different stores. So it was multiple mm-hmm. shipments. Okay. Is is my thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, you look at, like, Kenosha, Wisconsin. You can take the commuter train to Kenosha. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, like, over an hour to get up there on the commuter train. But that's in another state. Yeah. So that's still considered almost the Chicagoland area. Or, like, even, like, Gary, Indiana, which is right across the border. Mm-hmm. You know, it just seems to me that this had to be someone going into the stores and doing it. Yeah. But again, the question is why. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I know my dad. So I first heard about this case. I don't know why my dad was telling me about it once upon a time, but he was. (laughs) Well, he was living in Chicago at this time, so I'm sure he remembered it. Yeah. You know, I probably should have asked him, but I didn't think ahead. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I did all this research at work. So uh, luckily no one that I work with listens to this podcast (laughs) and can tell my boss that I was doing this on company time. Um, Like I do all my research. Um, So, uh, yeah, but anyway, he he remembered this, I'm sure, and he was telling me about it, and he, he always thought that they were targeting one person, mm-hmm. and, and they knew where this person shopped, that they shopped at, you know, maybe a couple of these different stores within the sub, excuse me, the suburbs, and so they left the bottles, and they would have kept going, except that person bought the bottle and died, mm-hmm. and so they quit. That's quite a way to kill someone, though. It really is. And that's, like, how do you know that they're going to pick up that specific bottle? That's the only thing that makes me question, like, they were targeting someone. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. Because that that has to be someone... Well, I mean, I guess if you want to kill someone, you really don't have any moral fiber. I don't know. I don't know. Because that's... Some killings are justified. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. That that's yeah. That I know. would be interesting. It would. I would like to read a book about this, some sort of fiction book. Yeah. I feel like this was probably had this happened now, it definitely would have been an episode of Law and Order. <laughs> Ripped from the headlines. Um but yeah, I I really I don't have any idea of what it was. I mean, mm. my guess is that it was someone if I had to make a best guess, it would be that someone was just trying to cause mass panic. Mm-hmm. Why? I don't know. For funsies, I guess. Yeah. Or maybe they had, you know, I, I really have no idea. But also, I feel like that's so much work to go that's through. That's what I'm thinking. Like, so methodical. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to Google this. Can you buy cyanide? <laughs> I assume they, I mean, obviously you can. I mean, if you Google Tylenol, the first thing that comes up under it is murders. Yeah. You can buy it, right? You can just buy it, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it has other use. I mean, I think you can, is it cyanide and rat poison? Yeah, the first thing that popped up is gopher killer at Walmart. Because, listen, I've seen 9 to 5 many, many, many times, and they accidentally put rat poison in their boss's coffee, and they think they poison him to death. And, yep, so that's how I know cyanide is in rat poison. But, yeah, that's why everything that you buy, including drinks, comes with a tamper-proof seal. 
because a whole bunch of people died in the 80s in Chicago. That's crazy. I can't believe I never heard about it. Me either. They're, they're very <laughs> famous. Yeah, they're, that's a pretty big unsolved case. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I like it because I really have no theories. Yeah. I really have no idea who did it and why. I mean, they all sound ridiculous, but they all sound plausible. I mean, there's people out there who do shit like that just because they can also. Right. Like, but then you'd almost think you know, that they would want to claim it. I guess, but not if you just get get a kick out of like, oh, I wonder if I can get away with this. Wow, I can. That's true. <laughs> That's true. You know, That's like, very true. Yeah. I, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody was just kind of like, huh, I wonder what would happen if I just like put cyanide in one of these. Right. And then it works. No, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah, that's I mean, that's probably what what I would lean towards. Yeah. Just, just someone doing it just some, to terrorize people. Yeah. Or just to see if they could do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's I it's insane. I mean, like I said, there's no evidence in mm-hmm. anything. No evidence of of no evidence. Mm-hmm. None. Maybe one day somebody yep. will admit to it on their deathbed or something. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing is it's not so old that it couldn't be solved. Mm-hmm. It's not so old that, like you said, someone couldn't confess. Yeah. Um, yep. But actually you can find when I was Googling stuff about this, um, you could Excedrin. So before, so obviously the little plastic foil, whatever seals that we have now were not um the the first um the the first iteration of like protective packaging after this happened mm-hmm. so i found this ad for excedrin um where they distributed it it was it's almost like a soup can <laughs> so it's like a can with like the pull top lid like a can of progresso <laughs> and inside is the bottle of excedrin what the fuck yes yes that's great yes so that was that was one of their first the first ways that they came up to make it tamper resistant because there's no way to take that top off yeah and put it back without it being obvious yeah that it's been removed that's funny yep isn't that funny anyway i got a kick out of that ad i'd never yeah. seen it before so i was googling this that's pretty great yep <laughs> That's all I have about the Tylenol murders. So, I chose Don Decker, a.k.a. Rain Boy, um, from Pennsylvania, 1983. In February of 1983, 21-year-old Don Decker is released from jail to attend his grandfather's funeral. Um, And previously, he had accused his grandfather, who was James Kishaw, of abusing him since he was seven years old. So, after returning from the funeral, he's staying with some family friends, um, he has his first paranormal experience. So, the first time it happens, it occurs in their upstairs bathroom, where he claims to have fallen to the ground and had a vision of an old man wearing a crown in a window. And when I read this, my first thought was hereditary. <laughs> that does that sound kid like hereditary. in the end with the crown on his head. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but it was a, it's like what I think of. Um, but anyways, after he has this vision, he develops really deep scratches in his wrist. But then later at dinner with his friends, the paranormal activity happens again. Um, and this time he claims to have felt a chill and then he fell into a trance. And at the same moment, the walls started to leak water. So once they noticed that Decker was in a trance, the Kiefers, who were his friends, called the police. Um, the landlord nor the family could find a leak or explain where the water came from. Um, the landlord said, after watching after watching it for a while, I discovered that it wasn't only coming from the ceiling down. It could come from the wall all over or from the floor up. There was no basic direction that it was coming from. It could come from anywhere. 
Police who were called to the scene said, I literally had a chill going up my spine, made the hair stand up on your neck. That's how I felt. This was a situation where things were happening that I never, ever dreamed could possibly happen. And there was no way of explaining what was going on. So after the police left, um, Decker and his friends walked to a pizzeria, which I thought was really weird. (laughs) (laughs) They're just like, well, (laughs) still hungry. (laughs) You know, well, they probably do after, you know, he went into a trance. Yeah. Um, So they go to this pizzeria where the water begins running down the walls again. Um, But this time, the restaurant owner, like, actually believed that Decker was possessed, and she pulled out her crucifix. And she claims that when she touched- when she touched him with it, he he was burned by the cross. So the police Mm -hmm. and the group returned to the house. The chief ordered his officers, basically, to never speak of the incident, because he didn't really believe it at all. Um... He didn't, he didn't believe it was a plumbing problem, but he also thought it was kind of ridiculous. He was like, let's just, just leave it alone. Let's not deal with it. Um, because really, like, why are the police even involved in the first place? Right. Because of water running down walls? I mean, if I were him, I'd be like, just drop it. (laughs) Um, okay, yeah. So the chief orders them to, like, just don't deal with it. But his officers go against his wishes and they return to the house but this time they bring a crucifix with them. And the officers claim that this time it didn't just burn him, but it made him levitate. Um, Lieutenant John Rundle stated, all of a sudden he lifted up off the ground and he flew across the room with the force as though a bus had hit him. There were three claw marks on the side of his neck, which drew blood. I have no answer for it whatsoever. And I just draw a blank even today. So... They take Decker into prison, or not prison, into jail. Oh my god. They take him to mm-hmm. jail, because they don't know what's going on with them. Um, and the Catholic priest is then brought in to perform an exorcism, basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it sounds like a movie, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I'm surprised this isn't a movie, actually, hearing this story. I know. Um... But, like, once the priest walks in, he falls into convulsions. Um, and, oh, wait a minute. Hang on. He's not in, okay, scratch all of that. He's not okay. in jail yet. Okay. Okay. Jaron, cut it. Cut that. <laughs> cut that. We skipped ahead I'm in the story. I'm myself. <laughs> they bring a Catholic priest to the friend's house. I was a little confused when I was reading my notes for a second there. I was like... This doesn't sound right. But they bring a Catholic priest to the house, to their friend's house, and perform an exorcism, and he falls into convulsions then. So, he's eventually sent back to jail, and I think the reason they send him back to jail is because he's originally in prison, or in jail, or whatever. Just for his grandfather's funeral, he gets out. So, they send him back to jail. Oh, so he was, like, furloughed. Yes. To go to the funeral. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. So, he eventually goes back to jail, and the rain phenomenon follows him. A jail guard, a chaplain, and a warden attest to the occurrence. Um, But the officers state the water did not just run down the walls, but sideways, upwards, even flying sideways through the air. (laughs) Oh my goodness, okay, it's like a tsunami. (laughs) I'm sorry, it's just so funny. (laughs) It is. Was this on Unsolved Mysteries? Yes, it was, apparently. Okay, I do remember this from an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on Lifetime. After I had done all my research, I found out that it was on that show, which I haven't seen any episodes of Unsolved Mysteries. Oh my god, it's amazing. I'm not redoing this research, so I'm sorry. It's amazing. I'm sorry for anyone who's already heard this, but... I had already done my damn research. I mean, I picked the Tylenol murders, which a lot of people have heard of, so it's fine. But this one, this one's fun, so it's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, Reverend Blackburn tries to basically force Decker into admitting that he's faking, and everything gets way worse. Um, Blackburn states, all of a sudden his demeanor changed and the smell came into the room. Nurses and doctors, medical people say when you walk into a room where someone is dying with a cancer or something, usually there's a smell. You can tell when you walk in the room. I smelled a smell like that multiplied five times at least. Evil. Foreboding. He raised his hand and rubbed his fingers together and all of a sudden it started to rain. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's just, just 
see him being like, <laughs> yes. like an evil tapping his fingers together, and it's just like pouring around him. <laughs> it's oh my god. Okay. Oh. Okay. Whew. Um, it was like the devil's reign. It was a mist. I was in the presence of evil. I opened up the Bible and started to read to him, but the pages never got wet. So help me, it was a frightening thing. I think I was praying more for me than him. I prayed, and it was only a brief period, and the rain stopped. So Decker claims after the Reverend prayed over him, the paranormal occurrences stopped completely. So basically what we have is nine witnesses, including Decker, who attest to seeing all of these paranormal incidences and are willing to go on record saying they saw them. Right. Um, so that's kind of like, that's kind of crazy to me because you read something like this and you're like, this is just, this is ridiculous. But for nine people to say they saw all this stuff happen and be willing to go on record and say this, I mean, you can joke all you want about like people being possessed, but I don't know if like, I personally would want to like go on record and say like, yeah, my friend is possessed because I don't think I was crazy. You know what I mean? Right. Um... So, skeptic Robert Bartholomew basically just linked the events to stress. Um, He said, human perception is notoriously unreliable, even under ideal conditions. Stress can alter perceptions, and it is difficult to imagine few events more stressful than believing you are in the presence of a man who is possessed by demonic forces. Um, And he also believes his trance states are easily faked, which obviously they are. Um, But he said, while so-called trance states may be triggered by stress and do not necessarily denote mental illness or disorder, they are also easily faked. It is remarkable Decker did not receive medical attention. Instead, attempts were made to exercise him. Which is true, because my first right. thought was, why did you call the police if he fell into a trance? Why didn't she, like, well- take him to a doctor? Well, and why didn't the police call an ambulance? Yeah. Because how many times, because I'm sure the police got there and they were like, this guy's nuts. So (laughs) why didn't they, like, have him hauled off to the hospital? Yeah. Seriously. Um, It's bizarre. Yeah. So this guy, Robert Bartholomew, basically believes it's a case of social delusion And uh, the Manufactured Housing Research Reliance states that Pennsylvania is at a high risk for moisture problems, um, including ice damming, which I'm going to try to explain this. I'm not good Mm. at this stuff. (laughs) But it's when, like, warm air enters an attic and it melts the snow on the roof and Mm -hmm. then ice accumulates because of that. And then water pools under the ice and causes leaks. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, so basically, like, the water leaking could just simply be, like, it happens in Pennsylvania in some places. Right. You know? Um, But, yeah, I don't know. I think, like, parts of it are easily explained away, and I think it's really easy to say, like, oh, it's social delusion and everything, and I think you can, you can make yourself believe anything you want to believe. But I feel like it's also kind of hard to get nine people to all basically say the same things, you know? Right. So that's that's the only thing that I'm kind of like, but how? <laughs> Unless yeah. they were just, like, continuously, like, reinforcing this story every time someone came around and, yeah. And they started to see it, too. Yeah, because I yeah. mean, like, I could see where, like, maybe the priests were, like, pretty inclined to already believe it. Mm-hmm. But... The one that gets me are the prison guards. Yeah. Because they're like, they've seen, they've seen it all. Yeah. Right? And that they would be so, and the cops would just be like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm totally going to defy my chief and be like, yeah, this guy's got scratches all over his body and mm-hmm. he's flying off the ground. <laughs> yeah. You know, it it's weird. I definitely remember those from Unsolved Mysteries, which you should absolutely watch, <laughs> by the way. It's on Amazon Prime. Oh. It's amazing. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what I believe. Why does he, does he think it was his grandfather haunting him? Probably. Yeah. Because okay. yeah. it, it he stopped, thinks that, He thinks right? he was possessed by his grandfather. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Were they on drugs? <laughs> it never said anywhere that they were. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess know. they could have been. <laughs> I guess. Why was he in prison? I forgot. Can um, you say? Shit. I don't remember. Okay. It wasn't anything that... 
It wasn't, like, drugs. No. Okay. I can try to Google it real fast. I'm just curious why he was in jail. Um, he was serving... A f- oh, uh, he was serving a four to ten month sentence for receiving stolen property. Oh, okay. I I don't know. I mean, I, it's definitely one where I can see that, um, like that. Yeah, I guess it could be true, but I can also see the skeptic's point of view being mm-hmm. like, this is just a weird incident that happened and then everyone just sort of spiraled from there. Yeah. Like, if his grandfather abused him and now the grandfather was dead, he obviously was, like, high tension, high stress. Yeah. And then the friends, you know, got caught up in it and then other people got caught up in it, you know? Yeah. I can definitely see both points of view. So, I don't know. It's an interesting one. I'm wondering like as i was reading it with like the water and everything didn't that happen in amityville horror the walls yes were... okay yes i wonder if Liquid this inspired came out of it. the walls nope no no amityville horror was before this oh was it oh, yes shit. that was in the 70s <gasps> maybe amityville horror inspired this <laughs> maybe it did maybe it did but then i also think like you said What is the motivation for the cops who I'm sure this is the kind of thing that would get you just like mercilessly harassed by other cops. So what is their motivation for going on record if they really believe it didn't happen? Yeah. Like they must really believe that they saw something. Right. I don't know. I don't know. It's very strange. It is. It's very weird. It's very strange. Hmm, That's a good one. I've... You know, when you said it, I'd never heard it. And then, like mm-hmm. I said, I remember it from Unsolved Mysteries, but I don't remember all the details. Yeah. I just remember the reenactment of, like, the water coming out of the walls. hmm Yeah, it's it sounds like, what's it called? There's a show that I used to watch on TV. Is it called The Haunting? I don't even remember. But it's, like, real cases of people whose houses were haunted. Oh, I think it's haunted. called, like, A Haunting? Yeah, that's probably it. They did yeah. the... They did, um, a haunting in Connecticut before it became a movie. I remember that. Mm -hmm. But anyways, like, this reminds me of, like, stuff I would see on there, honestly. Yes. Yes, it does. This also reminded me of, like, the witchcraft trials in Salem. Mm -hmm. You know, all Mm -hmm. of these girls who were supposedly, like, levitating and, you Mm -hmm. know, like, contorting their bodies and all of this kind Mm -hmm. of stuff and... And everything, and you have all the all these people from the town that are saying they saw it and everything. Like, mm-hmm. I just I'd be interested in just like a history of possessions over time, you know. Oh, I we could probably find a book about that. Yeah, but if you're interested in a book specifically about the Salem witch trials, I have a couple to recommend to you. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that I have read that are very good. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at QOTD Podcast, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash QOTD Podcast, Tumblr at Queens of the Dam Podcast.tumblr.com, and YouTube at Queens of the Dam Podcast. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and TuneIn Radio. You can also follow us on our blog, queensofthedampodcast.wordpress.com, to find bonus content and extra information on our episodes. If you would like to donate to our show, you can find us at patreon.com slash qotdpodcast, where you can receive special perks as a listener for becoming a monthly patron. If you would like to make a one-time donation, you can send it to qotdpodcast at gmail.com on PayPal. We'll see you next week. Bye.